Well, if you followed along with me last time, you've got a model looking a bit like this, which simulates uh, the cyclical growth model of uh, Richard Goodwin. And it's just showing the cycles, and notice the cycles in wage of share and employment always go back to the same point. And this is to remind you of the logic of the model before we start trying to change its structure. So we start over here saying gross investment minus depreciation is the rate of change of capital. So you integrate that, add it to initial capital stock, you get capital. Multiply that by the efficiency with which machinery turns energy into useful work and you get GDP. Uh, divided by the capital labour ratio and you get how many workers are necessary to operate that many machines, which then gives you a level of employment, which if you divide by population gives you an employment rate, and that then feeds down here into a rate of change uh, of the wages function. So the current employment rate minus the rate at which workers don't uh, get wage rises, multiplied by the slope of workers' reaction to differences between the employment rate and that zero rate, gives you the rate of change of wages. And if you then integrate that, model that, model by the rate of change of wages by the current wage, integrate it and you get the wage, the wage, the current wage, multiply the wage by labor, you get the wage bill, subtract that from the output, you get profit. And in Goodwin's simple model, all profit is invested. So that is therefore closing the cycle and bringing us back to this point. So that's the basic model. Now, what I did in my uh, PhD thesis was say, well, it's not really true that capitalists invest all their profits. They invest more than their profits during a boom and less than their profits during a slump. And to do that, you've got to bring in an investment function that is like the uh, wage change function we use for workers, saying investment is some function of the rate of profit. So I bring in level of capital, divide profit by capital, and now I've got a profit rate, which I'll use backslash PI subscript R4, rate of profit, and then wire that up, and let's just see how that behaves while we're still maintaining the assumption that all profits are invested. So you attach a graph there and see what happens, and you get investment cycling between 3% and 16%, uh, the profit rate between 3% and 16%. <clears throat> so what I'm going to have is, uh, to add to this, I'm going to add an investment function just like the uh, wage change function here, where, there's, where the zero point is in terms of the rate of profit and the slope in terms of the rate of profit rather than the employment level. So let's just do that. So I'm going to take a copy of the rate of profit, paste that over here, uh, subtract from that the zero point for uh, profit rate in terms of zero investment for this level of profit. So that's Z back underscore backslash pi superscript R, and that's going to be a parameter. Let's set it to say uh, 3%. So say 3% they invest nothing. Uh, maybe a maximum value of 0 0.6, minimum of zero, step size of 1%. And then you subtract type a minus key, press enter, subtract the actual rate of profit from that zero rate, and you've got the gap uh, that determines whether uh, with this level of profit will firms invest or not. So then multiply that by a slope, and I type uh, ups, uh, uppercase S backslash uh, underscore backslash PI superscript R for the slope of the profit function, and let's give that a value uh, of seven initially, maximum of 10, say minimum of one, step size of one. Whoops, that was a mistake. Just press the delete key when the blue dot is on there and nothing else is highlighted. That gets, gets rid of the line. So multiply that gap now by the uh, slope. And now what I'm getting is investment as a proportion of GDP. So I'm going to leave little i, subscript, big G for gross investment. That's the flow. And then I attach that here. And let's just put that through a percentage operator and see what values it gives. Um, they may be unrealistic, but the whole idea of using linear uh, forms is just to see what happens roughly 
if you're doing a serious model, you'd put some extra, um, pardon me, extra arguments on that to make this not as extreme. So the whole idea of nonlinear functions is not to generate nonlinear behavior, because notice in this model, there are no nonlinear relationships. There's exponential growth of the machine to labor ratio, but that's a straight um, a, a linear growth term. The percentage rate of growth of that ratio is a constant. Uh, ditto for population growth. Where you get your nonlinearities is you're multiplying um, uh, various elements together. So you're multiplying uh, wages by labor, and that's a nonlinearity. So as wages go up and labors go up, the uh, amount taken out of, out of output as wages grows proportionately, and the rate of profit is therefore lower than people expect. So nonlinearity gives you more realistic values. Don't worry too much about getting unrealistic values out of a linear model. Uh, in, in terms of where you're working to, it's always a prelude to bringing in more realism with, with nonlinear relationships there, both for wages change and for the level of, uh, level of investment. So that's giving extreme levels of investment, but let's just take a look and see what happens with the model. So I'm now going to say that investment is actually not equal to profits, but it's this share of, profit, share of GDP multiplied by GDP that gives you profits. So I take a copy of Y, paste that down here, multiply uh, gross investment as a percentage of GDP by, I'll just delete that and come back to it later, multiply that by GDP, and that is now going to be gross investment. So I'll delete that wire, bring gross investment down here, and wire them up, and that's now my level of gross investment. Now I can simulate the model now, even I haven't completed it by bringing in borrowing, and you still get the same basic shape. So saying that there's in investment driven by profit doesn't change the overall dynamics of the system. To do that, you've got to then have the firm uh, firms borrowing money uh, when they want to invest more than their profits. So investment minus uh, profits is positive, then the firms have to borrow money to make up the difference, and that's where you bring in another integral block here and make that D for debt. So investment minus profits is the rate of growth uh, of the of, of debt integrated, you get the debt level. And let's now divide the debt level by GDP and put that through a percentage operator. After we do the division. And that's now the debt ratio as a percent of GDP. Let's just move this all around a bit. Lots of tidying up to do here, which we'll do uh, at the end of this video. There's a debt ratio, and now I can graph that. Let's just move the uh, employment versus wages share over there. And let's now graph the debt ratio as well. Now, there's one thing I haven't yet included, and that is you've got to pay interest on debt. So I'm going to have the rate of interest on L for loans, uh, make that a parameter, give it a value say of 5%, maximum of 20, minimum of 1%, step size of 1. And if you now multiply outstanding debt by the debt ratio, that gives you, pardon me, I should have meant to and multiply to there, that now gives you the interest payments which I'll call INT here. And then I'll just do this quickly. Oh no, I'll make, take a copy. Take a copy of C, bring it up here because now your pro no, profit is net of paying both wages and interest. So now we've got the essentials of Minsky's financial instability hypothesis just by bringing in the realism that firms borrow money to finance investment. Now let's simulate that and see what happens. We've now got a rising level of debt to GDP, rising cyclically, a falling wages share. This is the thing I explained in manifesto. 
the rate of profit will actually be fluctuating around an equilibrium level. But this is what this particular phenomenon, though uh, manifests with a, a, non, a model with nonlinear behavioral functions, which I did back in my, my PhD, this phenomenon exp uh, gave me early warning that there was going to be a financial crisis in 2007, 2008, because the diminishing cycles this model generates, far from me believing they were a sign of a great moderation, which is the way Bernanke put it, and for which he took the credit, this was a sign of the breakdown that my model actually generated when I first built it back in August of 1992. And as I show, I think I showed in the last lecture I'll show in the next one, you can derive this model from strictly true macroeconomic definitions and simple behavioral relations as I've done here, a linear investment function as a rate of profit and a linear wage change function as a function of the, of the rate of employment. If you keep this model going on for long enough, you'll see the debt level, which is now fluctuating at a fairly realistic level, I might add, strangely enough, for a model that's so simply put together. Uh, but the cycles will get more extreme and ultimately there'll be a breakdown. So the diminishing cycles and rising cycles was a, a phenomenon of this model, which is actually related to the uh, area of chaos theory as applies to uh, fluid dynamics. This is called the pomo manaville intermittent route to chaos. And that was what the capitalist economy went through in 2008, and neoclassical economists didn't even notice. <laughs>